Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope your first week in lab went well and you're feeling a little more confident about the way this lab is set up. In this week's lab, we will be studying blood. Over the years, blood has had many religious, spiritual, and mystical connections. Blood has even been smeared on dancers' bodies and sprinkled on walls and statues to honor deities or even used to thwart evil. Many cultures have stories with mythical beings similar to vampires who rely on drinking blood for sustenance. If blood sets out in a container, it will separate into four distinct layers. It is believed that the system of medicine called humoralism adopted by ancient Greek and Roman physicians was derived from this separation. The four humors were called black and yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. Each one of us was thought to be made up of the four fluids, and when we are healthy, these are all in balance. But when we are sick or have a disease, one or more of these fluids was out of balance. Each of these humors was associated with a season and a person's temperament. This thought influenced Western medicine until the mid-1800s when Rudolf Virchow's work discredited the theory of humoralism. Today, blood has been used to save lives through donations, used in archaeology to study the past, help solve crimes, turned into food, and even used in artwork. This is Mark Quinn's self-sculpture. He is a contemporary artist who was brought onto the art scene with his 1991 sculpture titled Self. Here, he used 10 pints of his own blood to create a cast of his own head. Before we begin this lecture, I want to remind you about a few important points. Before you show up to take your first test, make sure you finish your notebook drawings for Lab 1. It will make a good study tool. Drawings should be neat, to scale, labeled, and in the correct order. Your lab TA and lab assistant will be checking them this week to be sure you are on the right track. Don't fall behind on this assignment. You will undoubtedly lose points if you leave it until the night before it's due. Hopefully you're watching this lecture before you show up for lab two. Remember, three points of test one will come from this lecture. This happens each week, but don't worry, these questions are general and not practical based. You can see on your screen some examples. If you have specific questions, please ask your lab TA. You will need to take at least two full pages of notes from this lecture, but you can happily take more. Don't forget to finish your review questions for lab one. They are due each week at the beginning of the lab. And as always, if you are confused about anything at this point, talk with your lab TA or lab assistant for clarification. Blood is classified as a connective tissue for two basic reasons. The first is that embryologically, it has the same origin as other connective tissues, and the second is because, as you'll soon see, blood connects all your body systems together, transporting oxygen, nutrients, wastes, and all those fun hormones you just learned about. You can use this concept map to help you further understand how blood is divided. We will be going over a lot of the map in detail as we proceed through today's lecture. Do you remember from the previous slide the two major components of blood? The image to your right shows you a test tube with a sample of blood that has been run through a centrifuge. After spinning the blood, it will separate into three layers, plasma, leukocytes and platelets, and erythrocytes. Therefore, the two major components of blood are formed elements and plasma. Formed elements make up about 45% of the volume of blood, and plasma makes up about 55%. Let's look into more detail about each of these. The first type of formed element are the erythrocytes. For clarification, site means cell, so we have our red blood cells. The second type are leukocytes, or white blood cells. And the third are thrombocytes, or blood clotting cells. So if formed elements are all the cellular components, then what makes up plasma? Well, plasma is mostly made of water, about 90% and it contains different types of proteins, as you can see here, albumins, globulins, or fibrinogens, or to name a few. It also has electrolytes, nutrients, hormones, and wastes. If you like podcasts, I would highly recommend clicking on these links and listening to these episodes of Radiolab. They're really interesting, and it might inspire you to become an artist or even donate blood. Erythrocytes are the most common cell type in blood. They're about 5 million per cubic milliliter, and every second about 2.4 million new erythrocytes are created. 1,001. There you go, now you have 2.4 million new erythrocytes. Take a second, and 2.4 million new erythrocytes, and make an observation about the cells you see inside the capillary to the right. What do you notice about their shape? 
From the side, these cells look like little dumbbells. This biconcave shape increases their surface area and reduces friction as they move past each other inside vessels. Each red blood cell contains approximately 250 million hemoglobin molecules. You can see in the bottom right corner of your screen that a hemoglobin molecule is composed of two alpha chains and two beta chains, each with an iron that will bind an oxygen molecule. When you do the math, that's about 1 billion oxygen molecules per erythrocyte. One interesting organism, the horseshoe crab, and you might remember this from Bio 182, class Meristomata in the phylum Arthropoda, uses hemocyanin instead of hemoglobin to transport oxygen. It has two copper molecules instead of iron, which gives the blood a blue color when oxygenated. In the presence of toxins from bacteria, specialized amoebocyte cells in their blood identify and congeal around the invading matter. Each year, over 600,000 crabs are caught and approximately 30% of their blood is harvested. This is valued at about $60,000 a gallon. It is then used in the industry standard LAL contamination test. 45 minutes of exposure to the crab's blood can identify endotoxins from gram-negative bacteria, which is like finding a sand grain in a swimming pool. The FDA requires that class 4 drugs in any medical equipment, anything from needles to surgical implants to pacemakers, that comes into contact with the human body to be tested this way. Just one of the many ways we have used nature to benefit humankind, and another reason we should be concerned with maintaining a healthy environment. This image shows you some different organisms with different colored blood. Some have blue, like we saw with the horseshoe crab, and others have green or even purple based off the molecules present that transport oxygen. Given what you just learned, why do you think erythrocytes might lose their nucleus during development? Their main job is oxygen transportation, so losing their nucleus during development increases space for hemoglobin and offers a bit more flexibility for the cell. Erythrocytes live about 120 days. Just like we age and get a bit more brittle and lose flexibility, so do our erythrocytes. As they move through the capillaries of the spleen and pass through sinusoids, they must bend and flex. As they get older, they lose that flexibility, the cell membranes rupture, and they are recycled into their component parts. The globin portion of hemoglobin will be broken down into amino acids, and the heme group is broken down into bilirubin, which is processed by the liver. In newborns, the liver is still developing and often can't process the bilirubin, which can lead to jaundice. In this week's lab, you will be looking at a blood smear and identifying the various formed elements. Here you can see the erythrocytes, the most common cell type in this blood smear. The dark staining leukocytes are here, which we will go over in a few slides. And the tiny thrombocytes at the tips of the arrows that help during clot formation. Okay, pause the video here and make some observations about this image. What do you notice about the erythrocytes here? Anything pop out at you? Did you notice anything different about these cells? If you said yes, then you are right. These cells are sickled. This blood disorder is called sickle cell disease, and one type of sickle cell disease is called sickle cell anemia. About 100,000 Americans are thought to have this disease, which can cause chronic pain, organ failure, or even strokes. Sickle cell disease is a hereditary gene mutation that produces irregular hemoglobin molecules, which alter the shape of the erythrocyte. So given what you know, why might that be problematic? First, do you remember this image? We said that the shape of the erythrocytes was important in its movement through capillaries. Sickled cells are sticky and can clump easier, blocking blood flow in vessels or to organs. Second, they are not as efficient in oxygen transportation, which reduces their functionality and can lead to anemia. The homozygous recessive genotype is lethal due to the complications. But what is interesting about the heterozygous individuals is that only some of the cells are sickled and in malaria-prone areas of the world, individuals who are heterozygous have a slight resistance to malaria. With malaria, a protozoan parasite transmitted by mosquitoes invades red blood cells and destroys them. With the sickled cells, the parasite cannot multiply as well, and that hinders the infection. That being said, there are rare cases where heterozygous individuals have died. Check out this 45-minute discussion about sickle cell disease. 
Currently, there are only two medications on the market, and this discussion explores many reasons why treatments may be slow, underfunded, or ineffective. The next type of formed element we'll look at are the thrombocytes. In this image to the right, you can see the size difference between some of the formed elements. Another reason making your drawings to scale and familiarizing yourself with the magnifications of the microscope are important. Here you can see the precursor cell of thrombocytes, the megakaryocyte in bone marrow. Thrombocytes are the smallest of the formed elements and are involved in forming blood clots. You will most likely go over the clotting cascade in detail in lecture. Pay close attention during lab because you will see them as small purple fragments in your blood smears. Leukocytes are much less prevalent than the other formed elements. They are formed in bone marrow, can live a few hours to several years, and are a major part of your immune system. These cells protect against bacteria, viruses, or anything identified as foreign. The leukocytes are divided into two categories called granular and agranular, and are involved in both innate and adaptive immunity. So let's first look at the types of immunity, and then we'll go over each of the types of leukocytes in detail. Innate immunity is the defense system that you are born with, and this mostly consists of barriers to prevent anything foreign or harmful from getting inside of you. Some examples are your skin, mucus, or saliva. Innate immunity is nonspecific, and it activates very quickly when there is a foreign substance around. An easy way to say this is that it is a reaction to microorganisms or foreign substances without prior exposure. Adaptive immunity, on the other hand, requires that your body be exposed to specific antigens in order to develop antibodies. Your body's immune system then builds a defense against that specific antigen. Here, prior exposure is required in order for adaptive immunity to work. This is the basis for vaccination. Doctors expose your body to a specific antigen, usually some kind of inactivated version, in order for you to develop antibodies against that antigen. In the bottom right of the PowerPoint are some good articles and documentaries that you may find helpful and go into more detail about vaccines. In this Venn diagram, you can see the cells, proteins, antibodies, and chemicals involved in a functional immune system. You can also see their roles in innate and adaptive immunity. Some of these cells we will go over in lab and others you will learn about in lecture. I said before that leukocytes are divided into two major groups. Those are granular and agranular because of the presence or absence of granules in the cytoplasm. The granular leukocytes are called neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And the agranular leukocytes are lymphocytes, of which there are two types, B and T cells, and the monocytes. Let's look into each type of leukocyte in more depth. So first, pause the video, take a moment, make some observations about these cells. You may have looked at this cell and said that it has multiple nuclei. You are right in calling the dark staining region the nucleus, but this is in fact a single nucleus with multiple lobes, and each of those lobes is connected by a small constriction. This is unique to the neutrophils. These are also the most common leukocyte. They use lysozymes and defensins to puncture or lyse the cell wall of bacterial invaders. So, if you had appendicitis, had your blood drawn, and then analyzed it under the microscope, you would see an increase in the frequency of neutrophils. This would be supporting evidence that you were suffering from an acute bacterial infection. On tests over this in lab, you will be expected to look through a microscope, be able to identify the type of leukocyte the pointer is on, and be able to tell your TA one identifying feature that helped you recognize that type of cell. In this case, multi-lobe nuclei. You will also need to describe why these cells might increase in numbers, again in this case because of an acute bacterial infection. Take a look at this image and make some observations about this leukocyte. What is different from what you saw with neutrophils? How is it different from the majority of the other cells? These cells are rare and you may have a hard time finding these cells in lab. You'll have to take your time and scan through the slide carefully in order to find these. Here you can see that they have a two-lobe nucleus and they stain an orange or pink color because of the stain used, which is called eosin. Therefore, these cells are called eosinophils, and they increase in number during parasitic infections as well as allergic reactions. Okay, what's different here? These cells stain a very dark bluish purple, 
which can oftentimes obscure the nucleus. These cells will also be harder to find in lab. It does actually have an S-shaped nucleus, but because of the stain, you usually won't be able to see it. The granules in these cells contain histamines and heparin and also help attract other types of leukocytes. These cells are called basophils, and you will see their numbers increase during inflammation and allergic reactions. Okay, observations about these leukocytes. You may have noticed that the nucleus is not lobed, is really large, and flat or dented on one side. You may also have noticed that the cytoplasm is clear or blue in color with no granules. These cells make up about 25 to 33% of all leukocytes, so they should be pretty easy to find in your slides in lab. These cells are called lymphocytes. A quick point of clarification, lymphocytes are a type of leukocyte. Many students confuse those two terms on tests. And if a TA asks you to identify one of these cells on a test, you should be as specific as possible. There are many types of leukocytes, but only two types of lymphocytes. And those are the B and T cells. You do not need to differentiate between the two under the microscope, but you will need to know the difference in their roles in the immune system. These cells increase with viral infections. An easy way to differentiate their functions is with this little diagram. In general, B cells attack pathogens outside of the cells, while T cells attack pathogens inside the cells. When B cells bind to an antigen, the B cells become plasma cells and crank out huge amounts of antibodies specific to that antigen. This is called antibody-mediated immunity. A quick refresher. T cells mature in the thymus. Remember which hormone is involved in their maturation? These cells provide cell-mediated immunity because cells, not antibodies, do the dirty work to destroy pathogens. We find these in lymph nodes, the spleen, and the thymus. And on our last slide here, what do you notice here with this cell? One of the first observations you may have made was its relative size to the surrounding erythrocytes. You may have also noticed that it has a really large kidney bean-shaped nucleus. These cells only make up about 3 to 8% of leukocytes, and they are activated by T cells. They are major phagocytes and function as antigen-presenting cells, meaning they will phagocytize a pathogen and then present an antigen of that pathogen to the rest of the immune system, almost like a flag or marker so the rest of the system is aware of its presence. These are the other agranular leukocytes called monocytes, and they increase in numbers during chronic infections. I told you that that was the last of our leukocytes. So what do you notice about this image? Well, this is our second blood disorder, infectious mononucleosis. What you are seeing in this image is an atypical lymphocyte, specifically a T cell. So when you're working in lab and scanning this slide, you're going to be looking for these irregularly shaped T cells. Mononucleosis is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. Most people are exposed to Epstein-Barr virus, but few actually develop mono. This also goes by the common name, the kissing disease. The virus first develops in the pharynx, usually causing a sore throat, and then moves into B cells. The T cells attack the infected B cells to prevent the virus from reproducing, resulting in the atypical T cell you see in this image. All right, your favorite, s'more practice. What cell is this? What morphological feature helped you identify it? And why does it increase in numbers? Well, this slide has clear to bluish cytoplasm with no granules. The nuclei is not lobed, and it's kind of flat on one side. So this is our lymphocyte. And how about here? Well, we can see granules and a very dark stain that blocks our view of the nucleus. So that is our basophil. And how about here? We can see granules and a two to five lobe nucleus. So that's our neutrophil. And last, how about this big one? 
And that's a large cell with a large kidney bean shaped nucleus. So that's our monocyte. Now remember, when you go to lab, be sure to make your drawings from the slides in lab, not your lab manuals. And I recommend trying to find at least five of the same type of cell for practice. Work with your lab partner and take turns quizzing each other by putting a pointer on different cells and have the other person tell you what type of cell, how did they know, and what happens when they increase in numbers. On your tests, your TA will find a clear example of the different types of cells. We're not here to try to trick you. If you're unsure, always ask them. Okay, so we have 10 more slides left in today's lecture. So this might be a good point for you to take a quick break, go for a walk, get a drink, or maybe even better, make a review over what you just learned. But for now, let's move on with blood tests and blood typing. The International Society for Blood Transfusion identifies 33 different blood grouping systems, but the most common is the ABO and the RH systems, which we will learn about today. A Czech serologist named Jan Jansky is credited with identifying the ABO system in 1907. He was actually trying to connect mental disorders with blood diseases, and while doing so, he organized blood into four groups, something that hadn't been done before. Unfortunately for his research, he didn't find any connections, but his organizational method was recognized as monumental in 1921, and he eventually earned a Nobel Peace Prize in 1930. In the previous section, I used the terms antigen, antibody, and pathogen that I purposefully did not define in the hopes that you will review those slides with the information we go over in the next handful of slides. Remember, a better way to learn rather than straight memorization is to synthesize, compare and contrast, and apply the words and definitions to other concepts. An antigen is any large molecule that can bind to an antibody and induce an immune response. An epitope is the part of the antigen where the antibody binds and is actually recognized by the immune system. An antibody is a Y-shaped protein made by B cells that is released in response to an antigenic stimulus. As you can see in the image on your left, the antigen is the red oval and on its surface are the epitopes. They are shown in different colors and shapes. The yellow Ys are the antibodies, and if you look closely, the portion of the antibody that is binding to the square or triangle epitope is specific to that epitope. A better example can be seen in this animation to the right. Here we see three different epitopes and one antibody. That binding site on the antibody is specific to epitope A. When the antibody and antigen bind, it is called agglutination. This creates a large complex that allows phagocytes to easily identify and eliminate the harmful antigens. To clarify, agglutination is not the same as coagulation. Coagulation is generally referred to as blood clotting, or when it turns from a liquid to a more gelatinous substance, and requires a much more complex series of steps in clotting proteins. As I mentioned earlier, we can thank Jan Jansky for his work and the current ABO blood system. This system is based on the presence of the A or B antigens on the surface of erythrocytes. Before we go on, a quick reminder about your genetics. An allele is one form of a gene, and you get one allele from each parent. Those alleles can be dominant or recessive. A person's genotype is the genetic makeup of the alleles he or she has, and the phenotype is the observable characteristics that result from that genotype. Therefore, in the ABO system, an A allele codes for an A antigen, the B allele codes for the B antigen, and the O allele does not code for an antigen. To clarify, if you have A blood, this is your phenotype. That means you could have the genotype AA or AO. If you have B blood, then your phenotype is B, and the possible genotypes are BB or BO. If you have AB blood, your phenotype is AB, and you can only have the genotype AB. And last, if you have O blood, then your phenotype is O, and your genotype is OO. This is an example of co-dominance, because the A and B alleles are both dominant, meaning when you have AB blood, both A and B alleles are expressed, and the cell surface has A and B proteins. Now let's take all this information we just talked about and apply it to this diagram to help us get a visual of what is going on. 
If we start with group A, or a person with blood type A, we can see that on the surface of that person's erythrocytes are A antigens, which if you remember are coded by either the AA or AO genotype. Well, that person also has B antibodies, meaning antibodies that will bind to the B antigen. So before we move forward, pause for a minute and think about what that means. Think about what is an antibody, what is an antigen, and why would a person with blood type A have B antibodies? So what did you come up with? Okay, remember, an antigen induces an immune response, and an antibody binds to an antigen, and they agglutinate in order to remove that antigen. So if your erythrocytes have the A antigen on their surface, then your body should recognize you as being blood type A. And if you had the A antibody, it would bind to the A antigen, which would result in agglutination and essentially self-destruction. That's not a great start to the day. If that's the case, then other antigens should be viewed as foreign and your body would try to protect itself from foreign antigens. In this example, you have A blood and therefore A antigens, but B antibodies. Remember, antibodies are specific to an antigen. So that means the B antigen is considered foreign. So having the B antibody, the one that will bind to the B antigen, protects you from foreign invaders. Otherwise, the B antigen. I hope that makes sense. Let's look at the other examples and clarify how all this works. As you can see here, the antigen binding site on the B antibody is specific to the B antigen, which is present on the B erythrocytes. Here, we see that B blood has the A antibody, and the antigen binding site on the A antibody is specific to the A antigen, which is present on the A erythrocytes. In AB blood, both antigens are present on the cell surface, because the A and B alleles are codominant and therefore both proteins are expressed. But with AB blood, there are no antibodies present. And that should make sense because if a person with AB blood had either of those antibodies, then those antibodies would bind to the antigens on his or her own blood cells, causing agglutination. Last, blood type O has neither antigen present on its surface but it does have both A and B antibodies because both would be considered foreign to people with O blood. So it's all about what antigen is present on the red blood cell surface, which will induce an immune response depending on which antibody is present. Whew. If you're still confused, don't worry. It takes a few times running through this and practicing. Let's apply what we just went over to a few different scenarios. Let's take a person with blood type B. What antigens and antibodies does this person have? The answer is B antigens and A antibodies. What would happen if this person received a blood transfusion of type A erythrocytes? The recipient's A antibodies bind to the A antigens of the donated cells. When we discuss transfusions, we are referring to a transfusion of erythrocytes only. Historically, blood transfusions were done with whole blood, but now blood banks usually split blood into its components. People receive erythrocytes if they have lost a lot of blood due to an injury, surgery, or with severe anemia. A person may receive a transfusion of thrombocytes or clotting factors with internal bleeding or hemophilia, or she or he may receive plasma with severe burns, infections, or liver failure. So what happens as a result? Well, in this example, agglutination would occur and antigen-antibody complexes formed can block blood vessels or organs, and this person could die. As you can see, being able to identify the blood type and understand which antibodies are present is really important in blood transfusions in medicine. Another blood identification test is called the RH factor. If you are homozygous dominant or heterozygous for the D antigen, 
you are considered Rh positive, meaning you have the D antigen present on your erythrocytes, as you can see in the bottom right corner of your slide. If you are homozygous recessive for the trait, you do not have the D antigen and are Rh negative. About 85% of Americans are Rh positive. So let's apply what we've learned to a real world scenario, one that some of you may be familiar with. But before we begin, in the upper right corner, there's a link to a video to help explain how all this works. You may want to watch this before we go through, or you could use it to watch as a review. Okay, first you need to know that Rh negative individuals do not naturally have D antibodies. Rather, they develop D antibodies when they are exposed to Rh positive blood. Therefore, if an Rh negative mother and an Rh positive father have a child, as you can see in steps one and two of this diagram, depending on the genotypes, the first child will most likely be Rh positive. That means that the mom may be exposed to fetal blood and develop antibodies to the child as seen in step three. This isn't usually a problem with that first child. The problem happens if they have a second child who is Rh positive. Remember, that child has the D antigen present on her or his erythrocytes and now the mom has the D antibodies. The mother's immune system views the fetus as foreign and the D antibodies can cross the placenta shown in step four and bind to the D antigen causing hemolytic disease of the newborn, essentially destroying its erythrocytes. During pregnancy, doctors will screen for this and prescribe Rogam around 28 weeks to suppress the mother's antibodies. A second dose is then given within 72 hours of birth to be sure. All right, our last bit of practice is to fill in these blanks. A person only has A antibodies and has the D antigen on their red blood cells. This person's blood type is? Hopefully you said B positive. A person has no A or B antigens on their red blood cells and also lacks the D antigen. What is this person's blood type? O negative. Well, that's it. So, in your lab, you will be using fake blood to identify the blood types that some subjects have. Your lab TA will go over this in detail, and the worksheet you will be completing will need to be stapled in your notebook after all of your blood cell drawings. Here's another useful chart that you might consider printing out or referencing while you're studying this week. And that's it for blood and blood typing. As a reminder, on test three, you will have 17 questions from this lab and three general questions from lab three, the structures of the heart and the electrical conductivity of the heart. So keep up with your exercise questions and your notebook drawings each week. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next week.